Hi everybody. Today I want to talk about the first way that elements can combine to form compounds. The first type of what we call bonding. The simplest type of bonding is what we call ionic bonding. In ionic bonding, we have elements that have either gained electrons or lost electrons in order to become ions. So we actually talked about this already when we did the FET simulation for building an atom. When you build an atom, you put a certain number of protons in the nucleus. Protons are positively charged. The number of protons determines what element it is you're talking about. But elements can have an equal number of protons and electrons, in which case they're neutral. If they have more electrons than protons, then they become an ion. If they have less electrons than protons, they also become an ion. There's actually two main types of ion. We have the positive ions, which we call cations. Positive ions form if there's more protons in the nucleus than there are electrons. We have negative ions, which we call anions. That's when we have more electrons than we have protons. If we have a positive ion and a negative ion that come near each other, what happens is they attract and they form an ionic bond. Okay, because opposites attract. Okay, in reality, ionic compounds are actually made of huge collections of the positively charged cations and negatively charged anions, and they're all arranged in what we call a crystal lattice, okay? It basically just means a large clump of positive ions and negative ions, but the positive ions always line up with the negative ions, okay? And we try to keep the positives as far away from the positives and the negatives as far away from negatives as possible, right? Because like charges attract, sorry, like charges repel, oppositely charged particles are going to attract, okay? So we want the attractions to be close, and we want the like charges to be far away, okay? So this is an example of what we call a crystal lattice. Okay, well, why does a substance form a positive ion? Why does it form a negative ion? To understand that, I actually have to reteach you a little bit something about the atom. The last uh, model that we used for the atom was the Bohr model. In the Bohr model, you have a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. Let's just say we're talking about lithium here. So we have three protons, and let's stick a couple of neutrons in there as well, okay? So we have three of our protons, okay? We use this sort of model where we said that the electrons lived in these little rings. On the FET simulation, we had those rings. And for lithium, for example, if I wanted to show neutral lithium, if it has three protons, it has to have three electrons. Okay, but when we put those electrons in, we found that the rings could only hurt, hold certain numbers of electrons. The first ring could hold two. So if I need three electrons, like for lithium, I have to put that third electron in the next ring. Okay, for larger atoms, this is for lithium. For larger atoms, we actually uh, can find that there's a certain number of electrons that fit into each ring. Two in the first ring, maximum, right? Max of two in the first ring. In the second ring, a maximum of eight. In the third ring, also a maximum of eight. In the fourth ring, you can actually fill 18. Fifth ring, 18, and then it goes up from there, okay? But we're only going to worry about the really the first 18 or so elements. I'm not going to ask you to do anything more than that. Okay, but it turns out this Bohr model is not entirely correct. If we look at the way the periodic table is arranged, there's actually some four sort of separate sections of the periodic table. There's a little chunk over here, there's a big chunk in the middle, a chunk sort of on the right side, and then there's this one that's separated down in the bottom. And now, on some periodic tables, we've got hydrogen up here, we've got helium up here. I'm going to throw helium over here with hydrogen. So this is hydrogen, this is going to be helium. So it's going to look, look a little bit different uh, from our periodic table. 
Okay, but what we'll see is that there's two rows before we line up with this middle section. Okay, and then there's about four rows all the way across. So I'm not going to draw, well, I can, why not? The periodic table actually looks something like this. And then there's two rows on this little loner group that's down here. Well, the reason the periodic table is set up this way is it's actually based on the distribution of the electrons. And it's not quite as simple as this little ring structure. Although you will see, if you look at the rows, the first row only contains hydrogen and helium. That's two elements. And remember, the first ring can only hold two electrons. If you look at the next row, it's got two elements here, lithium and beryllium, and it's got six elements here, going from boron to neon. So two here and six here actually gives us eight total elements, and that corresponds nicely with the fact that the second ring can hold eight electrons. If we look at the third row, again, two here, nothing in the middle, six over there for a total of eight elements, third ring holds eight electrons. And as I said, the fourth ring holds a total of 18. Well, if you add up all the elements in this row here, you actually get to 18. Okay, so the periodic table matches the way the electrons are distributed. But remember, in that second row, there's actually two separate groups. In the ring, we just plop all eight in there, but that's not really the way the electrons are distributed. They're actually distributed in a more complicated way. And so the way that chemists describe how they're distributed in the atom is what we call an electron configuration. How are the electrons actually configured? How are they actually arranged in the atom? And basically what we do is we put these electrons into little, I, I make the analogy like little houses, okay? They're not really in nice rings like this. They're in these very different shapes. If you take AP chemistry, I'll teach you a little bit more about what those shapes look like. For now, we don't really need to know what the shapes look like. All we need to know is that we need places for electrons to be. Okay, and instead of being a ring that's really close to the nucleus, what we say is that two electrons fit into a region of space that we call the 1S. Okay, that's sort of just like an address, right? I live on 1S Street, okay? And um, if we kind of go with the house analogy, right? There's a little house on 1S Street that two electrons can live in. And if I want to show those two electrons in their house, there's a special way that chemists do it. They draw an arrow pointing up, but then if I want to put two electrons in the same house, I have to draw one arrow pointing down. One electron is pointing down, one electron is pointing up. That has to do with something called their spin, which again, I won't really teach you until we get into AP chemistry, okay? So this is sort of like the first ring. Okay, that holds two electrons. All right, now the second ring, the electrons don't really live in these nice little paths like in the rings. Okay, they're in much more complicated shapes. But for what we need to know right now is that the, way, the place that the electrons can live, these eight electrons that we need to represent in this second row, the eight electrons actually fit into a house and an apartment building. Now, this, this house that we fill after the 1S, we call it the 2S, right? So it's a house on another street, 2S street. And in this house, we could fit two electrons. If we put two electrons in the same house, one has to point up, one has to point down. It's like if you've ever shared a really small tent with somebody, you don't want to sleep head to head. You want to sleep head to feet, okay? Even though you got to sleep next to someone's feet, it prevents you from rolling over and like accidentally making out with the person you're sleeping next to. So unless it's someone you want to make out with, that's totally different, okay? But here I'm like sharing it, like when I went camping this summer uh, with one of the math teachers and a bunch of other teachers, we slept head to foot. Okay, now the second ring holds how many electrons? Eight, right? If I'm putting two in this little house called the 2S, I can't just put two into this next place because that's only four electrons. 
So the next place where electrons live is actually more like an apartment building. It's like three little houses all connected to each other. Okay, we call it the 2P. Inside each of these apartments, we can put two electrons. But again, if two electrons live in any place, one's got to point up and one's got to point down. Okay, so this is a different way of explaining how the electrons are arranged than filling them into the rings like we did here. Okay, uh, after the 2P is filled up, we filled this entire row here. It's just like filling the second ring with eight electrons. Now we're going to go into the next row, the next ring. It's not really a ring. It's actually another combination of a house and an apartment building. We call it the 3S and the 3P. Okay, so you can sort of see like the ring here. This is like the one ring. These are like the second ring. These are like the third ring. Okay, and two electrons can fit into each box. Okay, so this would represent, let's see, what element would it represent? Well, we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons. So if we're looking at a neutral atom, 18 electrons, that's gotta be argon, okay? Now, argon is in this family over here that we call the noble gases. And the reason we call them noble gases is they don't like to react with other elements. Just like nobles, kings and queens, they don't want to go out and hang out with a bunch of commoners, peasants, right? They stay in their little castle, okay? So these elements don't like to interact with other atoms. The reason they don't like to interact is because they've filled up all of their houses and apartment buildings. They've got no room for electrons in their sort of like, uh, in their city, right? In the places where we can put electrons, they're all filled, like for argon, okay? Having all your little boxes filled here, like filling all your rings, tends to make you stable, okay? So actually when we talk about things forming ions, the reason they're gonna form ions is to try to fill up all of their boxes. Okay, so let's take a look at chlorine. Well, let's do fluorine. Fluorine is simpler. Fluorine on the periodic table has nine electrons. So with the Bohr model, we would put two in the first ring, we'd put seven in the next ring. Okay, but if we're going to use this model, the quantum mechanical model, we're going to start by putting two electrons in the first house on the block in the 1s okay so that's two the next house we're going to fill up is the 2s and we can fit two electrons in there okay now we're only at four electrons we've got five more to go so the next house that we go in they always fill from left to right as i've written them up here so the next place we're going to put electrons is into the 2p apartment building here okay it's got three apartments in it all right. Now, if you start to put people into an apartment building, do you think they're going to, like, if I put two people in an apartment and say, here, there's a whole big apartment for you guys, go nuts. Are they going to both live in the same unit? Probably not. If I start to put them in, they're probably going to want to take up their own unit first until you put too many people in the building and then they have to share. Okay. So um, what I've drawn here with two, four, six electrons is actually the, uh, uh, configuration for carbon. Okay, carbon's two electrons that need to go into this 2p, they're not going to pair up, they're going to be separate. Okay, but to get to fluorine, we got to get five in the 2p, right? Because we already had four represented, we got to get to nine, so we got to put five in here. So I've got three, if I want to put a fourth in there, now I got to pair up. If I want to put a fifth in there, again, I don't have any place for them to go, I'm going to have to pair them up with somebody. Okay, so this is the configuration for neutral fluorine with nine protons and nine electrons. But what we can see from this configuration is that fluorine is very close to filling up all of its houses and apartments. All right, it's only one electron away. If it was to just gain one more electron, then it would be completely filled. 
be a happy landlord, right? It's making the most rent it possibly can. Okay, so if this is the case, then fluorine, if it's going to fill up and gain another electron to fill up this 2p, it's got 10 electrons. But if it's still fluorine, it still has to have nine protons. So 10 electrons and nine protons, this is an electron negatively charged, it has more negative charges than it has positive charge. It has one more negative charge than it has positive charge. So just like in the ion composition, or sorry, the uh, FET simulation, we would say that fluorine takes a minus one charge, right? Remember, I think we said the charge was the number of protons minus the number of electrons. So 10 minus, sorry, nine minus 10 is gonna give you negative one. So fluorine forms negative one ions, okay? Now let's look at another atom. <clears throat> let's look at sodium. Sodium is Na, sodium has 11 electrons. So to show the configuration of those 11 electrons, again, I'm always gonna start filling them in with the 1s. I'm gonna put two electrons in there. Then I'm gonna start to put electrons into the 2s. I can fit two electrons in there. Next, I'm going to start filling in the 2p, which has three apartments in it. So let's see, I'm at four. Here's five electrons, six electrons, seven electrons. Once there's one in each, I got to pair up. Eight electrons, nine electrons, ten electrons. Now, sodium has 11 electrons. The next thing to fill after the 2p comes the 3s. Do I need to put two electrons in there? Well, it can fit two electrons, but we've already represented 10, and sodium only needs to get to 11. So there's only one electron in there to give us the 11 electrons from sodium. Okay? Now, again, this is like the first ring, the second ring, and the third ring. So the question is, how are we going to get sodium to be stable? How are we going to get it to be like a noble gas? Well, what noble gas is sodium closest to? If sodium's atomic number 11, we could go over and say, well, it's kind of like argon, right? But in order to become like argon, if sodium has 11 electrons and argon has 18, it would have to gain seven electrons, okay? So with the landlord analogy here, it's gonna have to build another apartment building, and then find people to live in all those little spots so it can be like argon. That's not very likely. For sodium, actually it's easier for sodium to just kick this person out of their house and just bulldoze this entire building. Okay, because if it does that, if it gets rid of that electron in its 3s, then it's got a filled 1s, a filled 2s, and a filled 2p. It's got a filled first ring and a filled second ring, and that's actually just like a noble gas, not argon. It's like the noble gas neon. In fact, on this little periodic table, I can actually see the electron configuration for neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So by doing this, sodium actually gets the same electron configuration as neon which is a noble gas. So sodium will become more stable if it gives up its electron in the 3s. Now, if it gives it up, it has to give it to somebody. Where is this electron going to go? It's not just going to fly off into space. It's got to have somebody to give it to. Well, if we think about fluorine, fluorine needed to gain an electron. Sodium is trying to give up an electron. So when ionic bonds form, somebody gives an electron to somebody else. Sodium is trying to get rid of this electron. It's going to give it to fluorine. So now fluorine is like neon. It's not neon because it hasn't changed the number of protons, but its electron configuration is like neon. That makes it stable. Sodium is like neon as well. It hasn't become neon because it still has 11 protons, but now it's got 10 electrons, and 10 electrons is a stable number of electrons to have. Okay, 
So if sodium has 10 protons and 10 electrons, what's its symbol going to be? Well, it's got one more positive charge than negative charge. So we're going to call it Na plus 1. Okay, so that's the process that I'm going to ask you to do on the first worksheet. I'm going to ask you to, ask you to fill in and draw sort of a diagram that represents the electron configurations and think about how can I either fill up my 1s, fill up my 1s, 2s, and 2p, or fill up my 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p. Either way, I'm going to try to become like a noble gas in terms of my electron configurations to make me more stable. Okay, eventually what this is going to allow us to do is if I know that sodium gives up one electron and fluorine is gaining one electron, well then one of each of those is going to balance each other out. So if I have a sodium with a plus one and a fluorine with a minus one, if I combine these, I get zero. And so these are going to combine and form sodium fluoride. On the other hand, we're going to look at other elements. Let's say sodium which forms plus one ions, combines with oxygen. Well, oxygen is one less electron than fluorine. So oxygen is actually eight protons, and normal oxygen has eight electrons. This is not fluorine anymore, this is oxygen. Now, to fill up oxygen's boxes, try to make it like a noble gas, neon as well, now I have to gain two electrons. If I'm combining it with sodium, sodium wants to give up one electron, okay, so that can fill one of the boxes, but how am I going to fill up the second box? Well, I can't do it if I only have one sodium. If I had two sodiums, each sodium wanting to give up one electron, each sodium could give one of its electrons to oxygen, and then we can fill up oxygen, and oxygen can be like a noble gas. So oxygen needing to gain two electrons, it's going to become more negatively charged. It's going to have two more negative charges and positive charge. It's going to form a negative two ion. But again, combining these two in a one-to-one -one ratio is not going to work, because this one's trying to give up one, this one's trying to gain two. So when they combine, we actually have to have two sodium plus ones and one oxygen at a minus two in order to account for the electrons moving around. So the way that we show this is to write the formula Na2O. We need two sodiums being plus one to balance and give up enough electrons for the oxygen that's trying to be a minus two.